Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to the uh, Doing Cool Things with Data with Splunk workshop, um, which I believe is the name. Um, so yeah, uh, just to, to give you a brief overview, Splunk is basically a really, really quite a cool tool for like taking any data that you have. Data, you know, what is data? Like anything to do with anything that, that generates logs or um, you know, a spreadsheet or anything like that. It doesn't have to be like really, really well form formulated. It doesn't have to be like, you know, if you do a lab report or something like that, you have like a data table. It's, it doesn't have to be a data table. Data is anything that contains information, basically. Um, and so we're going to talk about uh, today how you can actually take data from, you know, games and use them to figure out if your games are actually fun and, um, you know, basically use that to make your games more fun. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn on screen sharing. Cool, and you can see a recursive thing. That's great. Um, so this is based on a tutorial, um, which is available on the uh, Student R&D blog. Uh, if you go to studentrnd.org and click on build, and you'll see this big black box uh, somewhere over here. Let me go ahead and load this up. Um, let me also pull this up so that I can see the live chat. So if you're in this video uh, and you have any questions, um, you can feel free to uh, ask me the questions in the live chat. And this is probably going to echo for a second once it comes up. Cool. I'll mute the sound. Um, great. And it doesn't look like there are any comments at all. But yeah. So um, you know, over on this blog, you'll find this little thing right near the bottom that says Making Better Games with Splunk. And go ahead and click it and you'll get the tutorial. And it's a great little tutorial, and so we'll just kind of walk through it. Um, no need to read along. A lot of this is just sort of explanatory, and I'm going to explain um, a lot of the same things. So yeah. The way that people have traditionally been making games at, um, at Code Day is you, know, you spend 24 hours, or however long. It doesn't, this doesn't only apply to Code Day in your life, whatever. You spend some amount of time working on something that you think is going to be fun. And then at the end, you hope that what you've made was in fact fun and that people did in fact actually want to play it. And it turns out that most of the time that's not actually the case. Uh, it, this might surprise you and it might not, but I remember the very first video game that I ever made um, was actually uh, basically a combination between Minestre Minesweeper and Asteroids. So it was like Minesweeper in space with gravity um, and uh, a really cool game. The The thing is up on my GitHub, but for all the fact that it was a cool idea for a game, it was terribly, terribly, terribly unfun. And so it's basic, basically, you know, I spent six months working on this with some friends, building out the entire physics engine and everything like that, and we finally end up with this game, and we realize, oh, this is terrible. Like, the demos that we came up with uh, for testing out the physics engines were actually more fun than the game that we made. And like I said, this is on my GitHub. Um, you can go ahead and, if you just search for my name, uh, Tyler Menezes, and um, uh, probably just Asteroids in Space. I think it'll come up somewhere. So point being, uh, it's very easy to make a game that it turns out is not actually fun. And you know, we see this a lot. At a lot of code days, people make games that are actually really cool. The premise is really cool, but they're not actually fun to play. And in the case of the game that I was talking about just now, that was because the entire idea was terrible. But more often than not, it's actually just because people have done something very strange. Um, you know, like misordered the levels so that the hardest level is first, um, which is bad because it's confusing and, and users get frustrated. And I'll talk about why in a little bit. But basically, the solution to this, the, uh, the way that you make this better, is by collecting data on how the games are doing. Um, from users who are playing it. So you make one level, and you give it to a bunch of people, and you have them test it. And you see what problems do they have. Um, you know, if you're making a, just a really simple platformer game, how many times do they die? And if you collect that about every level from a bunch of different people, you'll start to see, oh, even though I know how to play this game, it turns out that these people don't understand how this works, right? Maybe they keep jumping on the spikes because the spikes actually look like teddy bears and they think that they can jump on the teddy bears. Um, maybe we should change that texture. Um, so that is, you know, really quite a big problem. Um, and that's how you solve it is, is you collect as much data as you possibly can. Um, and in fact, you know, 
a lot of companies do this. Uh, so I should have pulled up some examples beforehand, but if any of you have ever played Halo or pretty much any other first-person shooter, but I know that Bungie has actually talked about how they do this. Um, Bungie actually has game testers that go in and, you know, they played Halo um, a lot, and Bungie was actually mapping out where they would die the most, and so they could find out spots that were perhaps unbalanced. Like, once you got there, the first person to get there would never die because there was no way, as long as they had a sniper or something like that. And they could produce just these really cool maps of, you know, here's the entire playing field, here are some hot spots where people are dying more. Um, let me see, uh, Bungie, Let's see if I can find it, if it's, uh, if it's in the top thing, nope, I will, uh, perhaps post this link, uh, later. I might actually add it to the blog post because it is really cool, but, um, point being, you can get a lot of information for, from data. Um, and so just before we talk about how to use Splunk to get that data, I just want to talk about a little bit about what specifically you're trying to accomplish um, and, uh, you know, what it is that, that we can do with this. So um, what makes the game fun? Uh, basically what you want to do is you want to, you can see kind of in this graph, there's difficulty on one axis and there's time on the other axis. So as the player progresses through your game, they're going to get better and better. You know, they're going to understand... Um, take Super Meat Boy or something if you've played that. Like, they're going to get better and better at controlling the little guy who bounces off the walls and sort of slides down them. Um, and so consequently, the puzzle should get harder and harder to sort of keep up pace. So, you know, ideally it takes the, the person the same amount of effort to get through every level in the game, even as they're getting better. Um, you don't want it to be too difficult, and you don't want it to be too easy. Uh, but it does need to get more and more difficult as time goes on. Um, and so... You know, and th th this state of being in between too easy and too difficult. When the player is in here, uh, people refer to that as flow. That's what it's like to be in the flow um, when you're, a, you know, when you're a gamer. Um, you're sort of struggling, but you're struggling really consistently. And that's what makes a game fun. You know, it's, a, it's pushing yourself, but it's not pushing yourself too much. So you want to try to keep the players in this zone right here where you're not making it too easy, but you're not making it too difficult either. Um, in contrast, a lot of the games at Code Day actually look a lot more like this. Let me see if I can make this bigger. Uh, basically, the difficulty just jumps around. You know, the first level will be way too easy. The second level will be way too difficult. The third level will be, you know, okay. Fourth level is too difficult. Fifth level is too easy. Second, sixth level is too difficult, so on and so forth. Um, and so basically, the player is just going to get really, really frustrated really, really quickly and then leave. Um, you know, I've seen this a lot. I've seen this even in teams that participated in our summer program once. One of my favorite teams from our second year of running our summer program made this great iPhone game with like 100 levels. And all they needed to do was just reorder some of the levels for the most part just to make them more consistent. But because they didn't, the game was just really unfun. Because, you know, you'd play this one level and it would be like, oh, just walk across the screen to the right and you'll get into, you know, the, the solution. Um, and the second level will be like a really complex physics platformer puzzle with like spikes and stuff like that. And then the third level will be like, oh, you just, you learn how to jump basically or something, but you already had to jump on the second level. You, you can kind of see what I'm getting at here. Like you don't want to, you want to try to take the player through a consistent progression. Um, sometimes that's obvious. Like I was saying with this, with this game in the, in the summer program, it was uh, largely just that I, I think they didn't, put the levels together until the very end. And so, you know, if you spend a little bit of time on that, you can figure that out. But a lot of it is also not as obvious because you're making the game. And you actually understand how the game works a lot better than anyone else. The people who make their games tend to be much, much better than like 95% of the players who play the games just because the people who make the game understand everything about how it works and have been testing it over and over and over and have put a lot of time into it. Um, so that's the idea is basically, you know, figure out if this is what it looks like and then just sort of move it around so that, you know, the levels actually take this consistent path that sort of takes the player through a progression and keeps them in the flow. Any comments? No comments. Cool. Um, so next we're going to talk a little bit about how Splunk can help um, with this before we actually dive into the, the basics. Um, so it's using a, a tool called Splunk, and Splunk is this really, really flexible tool that helps you make sense of data. And again, like I said at the beginning, for those of you who aren't here, data is not just a data table, right? It's not just something that you'd see in a formal lab report or like, a, 
you know, it's not like if you know a MySQL database. It, it doesn't have to be super structured. Data can be anything that has information. When you have a bunch of it, you have data. Um, and so the easiest thing to do when you're doing games is to just sort of log things. So let's say, you know, I'm playing this game, um, and I'm just sort of, you know, if you watch my cursor or something like that, my, my objective is maybe to, um, I don't know, jump around or something like that. But basically, you know, I'm walking, I'm, I'm moving, 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 and at some point, like, I hit this logo. Um, and so the events here might be, as soon as my mouse goes onto the page, that's an event. You know, page loaded, game loaded, level loaded. Um, and then when I hit the logo, that might be an event. You know, this is a strange, terrible game that's not fun at all. But you can imagine how that would be different for, you know, a platformer. You know, if I uh, go ahead and, and find an image of a platformer, um, I don't know what this is, but, you know, this guy would be level loaded. If he picks up a star, that would be an event. Star picked up. Uh, hit the spikes. Died would be an event. Maybe died from spikes would be an event. Picked up key would be an event. Um, opened door would be an event. You know, those sort of things are all events. Um, and the idea behind event-based thing is that it's really easy. You know, wherever you're processing that, wherever you have that code that says, you know, if you hit the spikes, die, you add another line of code right after that that says, and also write this line of code to a text file that says basically, you know, hey, I died. Um, and so, you know, in code, um, depending on what programming language you're using, you know, even in JavaScript, it's just console.log died. And you could just, you know, put that line of code in your, in your if you're doing a JavaScript game, in your JavaScript game. If you're using C Sharp, it's um, uh, console.writeline. If you're using Java, it's system.out.println. You know, you're all very familiar with this. Console logging is used for debugging a lot to try to figure out what's going on. And you can also happen to use it for, for this sort of thing as well. It, that, and that's why it's so good is because it is so easy to do. It's very easy to add this sort of logging. You don't have to keep track of anything. Splunk will do it for us. So again, you know, the goal is to try to find as many events as you can in your in your game and put logs for them. So whenever someone dies, whenever someone picks something up, whenever someone loads a level, whenever someone finishes a level, those are all events and those are things that you want to add. And I'll give you a little bit more of a concrete um, detail later. So in the article, I also listed out some things uh, that you might want to send as, as uh, logs. It's like number of points, uh, health, whenever their health goes down, time that they spent on a level, um, number of moves, those are all sort of things that you want to understand about. But by doing it with logging, you can figure out a lot of those things without even having to, you know, necessarily spend too much effort on it. Um, so again, remember, it's, it's event-based. When, when something happens, then do this. It's not in a loop. It's not aggregating anything. It's always just going to be one line of code, emit this event, basically. This is a thing that happened. System.out.println or, you know, console.writeline. Um, and Splunk will automatically take this format and turn it into something else that's more useful. Um, the one thing that you do have to keep in mind is that the, uh, the timestamps, uh, you do need to have timestamps. Otherwise, you won't be able to calculate the times that have happened between things. Um, you don't technically need timestamps, I suppose, but it won't be as useful without them, and they're very easy to add. Um, and in fact, a lot of things will automatically keep track of the time. Um, Great. So, you know, this is perhaps something I should have mentioned at the beginning, but you do need to download and install Splunk. Splunk is something that runs on your local computer. At Code Day, we actually have a uh, website, splunk.codeday.org. Um, you won't be able to log into this right now because you're not at a Code Day, but at Code Day, uh, you will be able to log in and just automatically do all this online. Um, for right now, you do need to download and install Splunk. It's about a, a 70 megabyte download, I think. Um, and so if you're at the, uh, the event right, page for this uh, event. Um, sorry, I don't, I'm not actually attending this event. There. If you're at this, uh, you know, you should have seen this thing right down here that says uh, 3 p.m. download link. And so go ahead and click on that and uh, you can download Splunk for free. It is free. Uh, there's a paid version that lets you do more. But basically, it's just if you have tremendous, tremendous untold amounts of data, 
um, then you need the paid version. But for the most part, the free version will be fine for everyone. Don't worry about it. Um, so once you download Splunk, um, there's actually just going to be an icon on your desktop, and you double click it, and uh, it'll start up, and it'll automatically open up a web browser. And for the most part, when you're running it locally, um, you're just going to want to, in the web browser, type in localhost and colon 8000, and there's a link over here that will take you to the same place. Um, and then that will just sort of take you to this one page right here, um, you know, that, that just asks you for a login. Um, mine says Splunk Enterprise, but yours will just say Splunk. And you type in admin, and the password is change me. Um, in my case, I've changed the password, so the password is the password that I set. And once you log in, you get this really nice looking, beautiful screen. Um, you know, it's very, uh, not really flat, but you know, nice looking, um, trendy sort of, um, which is important. Uh, but yeah, so you, you know, you get the screen and it looks a little bit confusing because there's a lot of buttons. Don't worry about all the buttons. We'll talk about what they do. A lot of this is, is more useful to you later. You know, if you're actually gonna make a full-time game company, um, this would be a great tool to have because it can do a lot of different things, not just this small subset of things that I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to sort of lead you into why this is useful. So let's go back to this really quickly once you've got it installed, and you know, hopefully you guys are downloading this um, right now as this is going on. Um, Splunk is not a client-side uh, logging application. Um, to answer Doomblade's question, uh, Splunk is a... Uh, Splunk is a tool for analyzing logs, basically. Um, your logs yourself are basically just coming in as text files. You know, just plain text. You can copy them out of a console, you can have them written to a log. If you write them to a file, Splunk will be able to watch that file and see as they're added and automatically add them to your graphs and charts and everything. But um, it's not, it doesn't log anything itself. Um, and again, how to download, um, you know, it was in the uh, it was in the in the event thing, and so I think you should get, you should have an email with this in it, um, or you can just search for Splunk and Splunk, and there's a big download link. Um, but yeah, right here, 3 p.m. Splunk doing fun things with data download link, and I think there's also a link in the blog post. So great. So you know, we have this. Uh, you know, while you guys are installing this, let's let's talk a little bit more about this. So, let's say that you're making a game about. Um, I, I don't know if you've ever played Cut the Rope, but let me go ahead and show you a picture. I actually haven't really played this. I just understand how it works um, from watching other people play it, uh, sort of. But my my understanding of the idea is that you basically you want to cut a rope and you want to have this little candy thing sort of fall down and hit, pick up the stars, ideally, their bonuses, and then also get to this guy so that he can eat it, because he wants the candy. Um, and apparently the candy is better if it picks up all sorts of things that have just been laying around, like these stars. So, um, no, that's the idea. So think about it. What are some events that would be happening in this game? First of all, every single time the player loads a level, that is an event. The player has loaded a level. And we'll talk about why that was important later when we actually try to make a graph. Um, some other events, when the player cuts the rope, that's an event, that's something that has happened. Um, when the player picks up an item, like a star, or uh, you know, like a, let's go ahead and make this a little bigger, you know, when the player picks up a star, um, that is an event. And I think there are only three in any level, that's what I can gather, so, um, you know, it's basically just gonna be pick up a star, pick up a star, pick up a star. And you'll never see more than three of those in a row um, without the level resetting. Uh, whenever the player hits the retry button, um, that's an event. They're resetting the level. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, whenever the monster eats the candy, um, that's an event. And also maybe if the candy gets blown up by these things. I've actually never seen this picture before, so I assume that that's bad, but um, it's not in the example. You know, there are plenty of events like that. So those are some events that you, that you might see. And you, you'll see, here's an example of what a log from Cut the Rope might look like. So you can see, you know, at 10.24.01, the player loaded level one. Um, there's some sort of weird bug here. At, uh, you know, 10.24.05, they cut the rope. At 10.24.06, they collected a star. At 10.24.18, they reset the level, um, you know, and they continue. And then, you know, at 10.25.14 p.m., finally, they collected the candy, and then they loaded the next level. And you can see how that would go on. Um, 
So right under this you know, example, uh, since a lot of you don't have games at this point, uh, I actually made just a uh, sample bit of data that you can use. So you'll see over here, you know, here is the actual, here's just a bunch of logs. Again, plain text, just something that you could see in your console. Um, and so what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to save this as a file to my desktop. And I am just going to call it um, game underscore data dot log. Use dot log. Oh, and I think in this tutorial I called it gameplay data. So I'm going to go ahead and rename it gameplay data dot log. Perfect. Um, if you don't have a Splunk account, it is free to make one, um, and uh, you can just put in zeros for your phone number, and uh, you know it's not very hard. Um, again, at Code Day, we'll I think have a, a local copy so that you don't have to download it, and we'll also have this online one that you can use uh, for free. Um, so, uh, you know, you take the sample data. We have it on our desktop now. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and try to get it into Splunk. Uh, this is where it gets really cool. It's, it starts to get progressively more and more cool as you realize what's happening. So, you know, I've opened up Splunk. Again, there's a desktop shortcut, or you just go usually, if you've installed it locally, to localhost colon 8000. Um, I'm going to go ahead and click on Settings and Data Inputs. And a lot of button presses, but they're pretty obvious. Add data. I want to add the data. I want to add a file. Um, and you can see that this is kind of, you can, if you're familiar with logging, it is, you know, it'll support a lot of logs things out of the box. But for right now, we're just going to, we're going to add data. And I'm going to uh, consume a file on this server. Don't worry about what it says. Click Skip Preview. Um, and then go ahead and click Upload and Index a File. And I'm going to choose that file that I saved from my desktop. And those steps are also uh, right here in the blog post. So again, um, Note this blog post. Uh, oh, I can't link things. So if you type student rnd.org slash, wow, it really doesn't like links at all. OK, I can't post links. I'm sorry. Um, YouTube. Um, Eric, for company, you can just kind of type whatever. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a big deal. Um, so anyways, um, you know, in the blog post, we have the same thing, settings, data input, add data, a file, and upload and index the file. So go ahead and click Save, and it'll say Success. And it's got this really cool Start Searching button. Um, and so I'll give you guys a second. Go ahead and check this. No new comments. Cool. Great. So we're going to go ahead and click Start Searching. Um, so you get this big search box. It's like Google, right? And you can actually just start typing in things. So you know, in the in the thing I say, source gameplay data dot log. For right now, I'm just going to type level reset. You can see right down here it says matching searches. It's got the cool autocomplete level reset. You can see, oh, cool. Here's all of our level resets. Um, you know, I at 11:09, 24 a.m. I reset to level. You know, I reset level 29, and it looks like I've done it a few times. And you get this little graph over here of all the different times that level resets have happened, and it's, it's great. Um, not really all that useful yet. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Unix, uh, you might know that you could actually just, um, you know, type grep, basically. Uh, cat, this file, grep. It's not actually basically what I'm trying to get at that hard to do what we've done yet. But, you know, it's, it's getting kind of cool a little bit. It, it looks a little bit nice. Um, the thing that we actually have to do to do really cool things with Splunk is basically tell it how to understand our data. And the way that we do that is the easiest way is, you know, we've done this search. I'm going to go ahead and click this arrow under the I. I'm going to click Event Actions. And again, all of this is in the blog post if you're confused. Uh, this video will also be recorded. Um, so as soon as it's done, you can go ahead. You can go back right now even. Uh, it's great. Uh, so I'm going to, you know, click this little arrow next to any one of these lines and click Event Actions, and Extract Fields, and it'll open up a new tab. Great. So here's a bunch of our data. You'll see it over here, you know, sample. It says sample. 
And uh, basically, the way that you get data from Splunk, the easiest way for you to tell it is to just give it an example for what to look for. And so in this case, we want to extract basically this column, this thing that's going to be rope cut, level reset, start collected, basically the game event. Um, you know, I'm going to call this the game event. There's also one other thing that's part of some of these rows, which is the level number. So whenever the level is loaded or reset, it also has a level number. We'll deal with that later. For right now, let's get the actual action that the player did. Cut the, the rope, you know, reset the level, so on and so forth. So we're going to go ahead and just give it some examples of what we're looking for. Rope cut is one. We're looking for things like level reset. Not level reset 29, just level reset. Not the timestamp, just level reset. We just want to know about level resets. Um, how about a level loaded? And you know, I, I, you'll, I'll show you, you don't even need all of these. So even though I haven't included candy collected or star collected, it'll generally get an idea of what we're looking for. So I'm going to click generate, give it a second, and oh look, it highlighted all of them, even things like star collected that I haven't told it about. It just sort of figured, oh, this is what it looks like, this is what he's looking for. You'll notice it also did not highlight 29 or 27 or any of the level up numbers. It didn't highlight timestamp. It is saying, oh, this thing that I'm about to save is only this one, basically this field right here. If you're familiar with regex, you can actually edit it right over here. Don't worry about that um, uh, unless you know what that is. So, you know, basically, as long as this looks right, as long as it's highlighted, the thing that you consider a field, which is a bit of data, basically, something that can be analyzed, um, then then that's great. Um, questions? Cool. Any questions? Oops. Questions are here. Great. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and click Save. And I'm going to give this a name, and I'm going to call this Game Event. You could call it player event. It doesn't matter what it's called. It should just be something reasonable. Calling it XXYX is probably a bad idea. So I'm going to call this game event and hit save. Cool. And it says your field extraction has been saved. Click close, and it'll close out. And then you can go back here. And uh, yeah, so it's done. Now there's one more. Again, we have this 29, right? You can see I can double click on things, by the way, and it'll automatically filter them, which is kind of cool. So I also want to get information about this 29. I want to tell Splunk about this 29. So same thing. Click on the little arrow under the I, click Event Actions, Extract Fields. And basically, in this case, I'm just going to give it, you know, I'm looking for things like 29, 28, 27. Hit Generate, and you'll see it's automatically extracted all of them, not only those three numbers that I gave it, but all of the previous ones as well. So it looks right. I'm going to hit Save, and I'm going to call this Level Underscore Number. And it's done. Great. So, you know, we before we just search for level reset, and you'll see it highlighted all of them, we can now search a little bit more complicated. We can do game underscore event. Remember, that's what we called our field, is equal to level reset. OK, great. That's really exciting, you know, really cool. Not really. But now we can do other things as well. So we can do. Um, you know, we have this data now, and we filtered it. We told Splunk to filter it by searching, basically, like Google. You've told Google to search for something, and it's, it's found you a set of results out of all of the data that it has. Um, and, uh, you know, it's great. Unlike Google, with Splunk, you can tell it, OK, take this data and do something cool with it. And the way that you do that is with this pipe character. Um, so if you're not familiar with this, uh, this is used a lot in, in Linux, um, in the command line in Unix. Um, Basically, it is the character under the delete key uh, on a Mac or uh, on a, a backspace key on a PC. And so you'll see, you know, it's the one that does the backslash, this one, the one that sort of goes, you know, as you go from left to right, from up to down, not the one that you put in URLs. The one that you put in URLs is the forward slash, the backslash. Um, if you hit shift and hit the same key, you'll get a perfectly up and down line, not to be confused with an L or a 1. Um, so again, under the delete key or the backspace key if you're on a PC, um, you'll have this thing right here. Hit shift and you'll get this. Um, let me just go ahead uh, because it's called a vertical bar as well. Um, some play, some uh, keyboards put it right here as well, um, next to the plus and the minus. Um, 
So basically, you're just looking for something that is a perfectly up and down line. Some keyboards have a little break in the middle of it. You can kind of see. Uh, thank you, Google. That is what I wanted you to do. You can see there's this little break. Basically, you're looking for this key on your keyboard. Um, and uh, so you want to hit that. It's the pipe character. Um, and basically, that means pipe it. I want to take all of the data, and I want to sort of squish it into a ball, and I want to pipe it somewhere else. Basically, I want to take the output of one program and put it into the input of another program. Um, and so in this case, the first program was a search. And the second program that I want to pipe it to is time chart. And I want to get a chart of the counts over time. And so you'll see that I typed, you know, game event level reset pipe character time chart count. And I go over to visualiz visualization, and you'll see, oh, here's this really cool chart of player resets over time. You know, this is getting a little bit cooler. Like I said, still not that useful, still not the coolest sort of thing that Splunk can do. Um, so instead of just doing over time, what if we want to find out how many resets players have done per level? Um, so which levels are causing players to need to restart the game the most? Again, remember, this is uh, cut the rope. So you know which levels are most frustrating where they have to start over from scratch on that level? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, instead of piping it to time chart, I want to pipe it to chart count. So I want it to chart the count by level underscore number. Remember, that was the second field that we extracted. Hit enter, and there we go. So you'll see all of the levels that are zero are automatically removed. Um, there's ways to get them back, but don't worry about it for now. So you'll see level eight, uh, the player reset two times. Level nine, the player reset once. You know, level 18, the player reset once. Most of the levels, they're not even resetting at all. Um, this isn't level, but it's not bad. One, a difference between one and two is not bad at all. So it actually, from this perspective, looks pretty good. Um, you know, you can see that you know, the player is resetting not all that often. Great. So our, our game is good, right? Well, there's other ways to look at this data. And the cool thing about Splunk and the cool thing about making it a event-based data source, you know, this console log thing, is that you can look at your data in as many ways as you want, and Splunk makes it really easy. So again, I want to look at the level resets, um, and I want to pipe that to a chart. But first of all, let's actually figure out how long, let's say that we want to know how long the player is on the level. So I can pipe it to a different program first uh, in Splunk, and this is called transaction. This is all in the blog post again. You know, feel free to look at it. So I want to look for basically a transaction is just a thing that happened um, that involves multiple steps. And so in this case, uh, it's everything that ha in this case I'm looking for something that starts with a level being loaded and ends whenever the next level is loaded. So I'm looking for a transaction where the game events, and this is all documented. So you can see uh, I'm looking for transaction where the game event starts with um, level loaded. Put this in quotes, I think. So basically, I'm going to make a list of, uh, of things that have happened uh, after the player loads a level. Uh, why is this not working? Uh, because of this. So I actually don't want to filter this at the beginning. I want to do just source equals gameplay data dot log. That is more like it. So I'm looking at all of my gameplay data and then making transactions out of those. Basically, I'm figuring out when a level started uh, and finding everything that happened after that. So cool. You can see that it's working, and it's actually automatically picked up on the fact that the timestamps are there and everything and sorted it, and it's great. OK, cool. Next, I want to know how long they were on the level. Um, Splunk has a function for this. Just to be clear, the way that I found this was Googling. So you don't need to read all of the documentations. You just need to Google for what it is that you want to do. Splunk has their own version of Stack Overflow, um, basically. Um, uh, stack Overflow. Um, I actually can't remember what it is. Anyways, if you search for Splunk questions, you'll find basically a custom version of Stack Overflow, which is actually powered by Stack Overflow. And if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. But basically, people will answer all of your questions for whatever it is that you want to do. There's an answer out there. It's great. Um, so I've taken I've taken the gameplay data. I've taken that and I've put it into this other program, which automatically finds out when the level has started and breaks things down into things that happened in that level. 
And then I want to, again, take the output from that, which is this list of things that have happened in each level, and I want to put it into um, a thing called stream stats. Um, range underscore time is what I called it, as duration window equals two. Again, I Googled for this. Don't worry about what it does. Um, you, can, you can just copy and paste it if you want. It's over here. Um, chart, and then, so now I want to make a new, I'm, you know, I've taken the output of that. I've got the duration. And I want to make a chart of the average duration by level number. So the average amount of time that someone spent on a level before loading the next one. Um, oops, and I'm missing a pipe character. There. This is cool. Now this is, this is, look at this. This is the average duration that a player has spent on a level in seconds by level number. So this includes resets. If they reset the level over and over and spend a lot of time working on it, you know, that will, that will actually, you know, be something that they'll, they'll need to, um, that this will take into account. So you can see that the first level, like 20 seconds, in fact, on average, it looks like most of these are about 20 seconds. Um, but you'll see that some of them are actually quite a bit more. So for example, level 29 took 58 seconds. It took basically three times as long on level 29. And level 19, 50 seconds instead of the average of somewhere around 20. So you can see that basically level, you know, levels 8, maybe 9, 12, 15, 19, 21, 24, they might actually be too hard for the player at this point. You might want to kind of redistribute them. Ideally, you want this graph to be about the same. It should take players about the same amount of time for each level, maybe slightly going up over time. It's okay, for example, for the last level to take a lot longer because it's sort of the culmination of everything. Or like a boss battle or something, if your game has boss battles. It'd be okay if those take longer. But on average, the player should not be spending, it shouldn't be going up and down, you know. It sh level 2 should probably not take 10 seconds. That's probably too short. Level 23, really late in the game, should not take 10 seconds. That's just too short. And so basically from this log of data, you know, remember, think back to what we had way up here. We had just a timestamp, level loaded, star collected, level reset. It took a few seconds to add it to the game. We've now made this really, really insightful chart where now we can see, okay, it, you know, it seems like I need to make level 8 a little bit easier or maybe move it later on in the game. And, you know, I need to make levels 2 and 23 maybe a little bit harder. Um, and so that's the sort of, that's, you know, the sort of uh, the power of this is because now we've looked at this data and we found, okay, here's a really simple way that I can make my game better. All you need to do now, let's say that you, you spent, you know, at code day, let's say that you're at code day, you spent a long time on this, it's now like 4 a.m., you ran this data, and you see, okay, these are out of order. All you need to do now to make your game maybe twice as fun is just move these levels around in the game so that they're, you know, they correlate with the difficulty. So that it becomes more, you know, that the, the player spends about the same amount of time on the levels as, as time goes on. They're not getting stuck at these levels that are really frustrating. And that will actually make a tremendous difference. So instead of spending more time working, instead of having to work harder, you can actually work more smart. Um, smarter. You can, you can uh, reduce the amount of work that you actually need to do by just thinking really carefully about how it is that players are interacting with your game, which is, to me, really quite powerful and, and, and very exciting. So again, you know, from just these events right here, just this, this list of things that have happened in your game that we, we took as this, uh, this text file, this one right here. And again, this could just be copied and placed, pasted from a console. Um, you know, this list of, of things that have happened. Um, we've taken that and we've turned that into this really cool visualization of, um, of player time on levels, which is actually very helpful to us and will help us to make our game better. And it'll only take like a half an hour to act on this, which is great. Um, so of course, this is just the very beginning of things that you can do with Splunk. Um, it does a lot of different things. You can correlate different data. Um, you could, you know, figure out if you're doing a website, you can figure out page load time by what sort of thing they're doing. You can figure out information about, you know, let's say that you're making Facebook. Um, you can figure out information about how your users interact with each other. All you need to do is log things like sent message. And then you can, uh, you know, you can go ahead and take that information like sent message um, and, uh, and turn it into uh, really cool things. Where is this? 
Where has this gone? OK, well, I can't find it. Um, Uh, if you're getting no results, make sure that you're following the tutorial uh, carefully. I, I mean, that's not really enough information for me to be able to figure out why it is. But make sure that you have, one, imported the data, which is way up here, importing your data. Um, two, that the file was named the same thing. Um, three, that, uh, you know, you have done this section called understanding your data, where you have to tell it information about your data. That four, you called the, the thing that you saved when you get this yellow highlighted things down here. This makes it worse. This yellow highlighted things down here that you call those, um, you know, game event, um, and so on and so forth. I mean, this is something that's not just, you can't just sort of follow what I, what I do loosely. Um, it's something that you should be thinking about what you're doing at least a little bit. Um, you know, so go ahead, go back, look through the thing if you need to, but also think about what you've done. If you've named something differently, the name is going to be different. You know, that's just, that's the way that computers work. Um, they're not going to complain because it's a valid name. It's just that you've named it something different. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, you know, like if you're making Facebook, you just have to log when whenever a user sends a message, and now you can find information about what time of the day is most popular with people sending messages in the U.S. Uh, what age groups send the most messages? Um, you know, you could probably make all sorts of inferences. Facebook is able to determine relationship status even before you update your relationship status just by things like um, how often you mention them, how often you message them, things like that. They actually wrote a paper about this. Um, you could take data from an online dating site and, and correlate it and, and query on that this month. But, you know, there are all sorts of things that you can do that are actually really quite useful um, in all sorts of domains with this because event-based data is so easy to get. It's great. Um, and so, you know, if you want more information about that, go ahead and go to the blog post. Um, there's the uh, source cheat sheet uh, right over here. You can see it's linked to. This one is great. It gives you a really good overview of how everything works. Um, and then there's also the official docs, which I, I think when I tried it earlier today were actually down uh, because the weekend, okay, it looks like it's back. Um, and I guess they were updating their server or something, but it looks like it's back now. So, um, yeah, you know, Splunk, really, really quite cool tool. And, uh, you know, we'll, uh, it, it is a, a great thing to, uh, to be playing around with. And, you know, they were very kind to, to sponsor Code Day um, quite a bit and have helped us get quite far. So that is it uh, for the Splunk tutorial. Um, again, if you have any questions, if something isn't working, um, Make sure that you follow the tutorial really closely or just think more carefully about what it is that you've done. But basically, you know, go to studentrnd.org. I cannot post this in the chat. I don't know why YouTube has blocked it. You want to go to studentrnd.org, click up here on build, or uh, whenever this finishes loading, you'll see down here there's a picture of Adam holding a bunch of hammers. Um, so you're going to want to go ahead and click on this um, and uh, scroll down, and you'll see making better games with Splunk. And that's the, that's the explanation. So. Uh, that's it. And uh, if anyone has any general questions, if you have specific questions, like I said, it's really difficult for me to answer because I don't know exactly what state your thing is in. Um, but if anyone has any general questions about Splunk, um, I am happy to answer them. Otherwise, uh, uh, thanks everyone for attending. Okay, great. Thanks everyone for coming again. And uh, don't forget, there's another really cool workshop after this um, on a different channel, obviously. But um, you know, just click on Student R&D. You'll see live events, and you can get uh, a lot of information about what else is going on. So, um, yeah. Again, thanks for coming. And uh, you know, if you have any questions on Splunk, feel free to email me or um, you know, or come to Code Day and ask someone there. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye.